Hey guys, what's up? This is Chad Hermanson and we're back. Today I have a very special guest, Craig Wilson, who is a former teammate of mine. We played together in Nashville and in Pittsburgh with the Pirates. He is one of my best friends. We have, we've really stuck together throughout our whole career. Um, we, we're now in our 40s. We have kids. It's pretty awesome. So Craig, I want to welcome you and thanks for coming on with me today. Hey, thanks for having me. So what we've been doing is we've been talking about the, the mental game, you know, and how the ups and downs of this game, how it works. I wanted to kind of start with you and if you will kind of take us through like your high school career, kind of starting in high school, what kind of player were you, where were you drafted? And let's kind of take that little kind of that course all the way up to the big leagues. Okay. Uh, in high school, I was basically a catcher. Um, in certain leagues, I played a little bit of outfield for a break from catching. Um, I was drafted in the second round by the Blue Jays mm -hmm. and went ahead and signed. And then working my way up, I, I basically caught um, until I think it was about four or five years in. I blew up my elbow. I had Tommy John surgery. Uh, started As a catcher. A little bit of, as a catcher, as that, a catcher. that's correct. That's unique. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't happen often. Uh, but I started then playing a little bit of first base, a little bit more outfield. Uh, and then when I got called up, I kind of became a utility guy where I could play a little bit of everywhere. Yeah, so, so we were actually drafted the same year. And yes, we, we were. kind of had that connection up until then. I, I think our first time we played against each other may have been in maybe A ball or, or high A ball somewhere. Yes. Along the way. Yeah, so so Craig has well, mucho power. He, he has to big power. that he, he was known for his bat. Um, when he got up to the big leagues, uh, we, we first kind of started when he got traded over to the Pirates, uh, came with us in Nashville, and, and automatically just started showing his power. So let, let's talk about, like, your transition. Was there, as a catcher, obviously, to me, that's – that's a very – probably the most difficult position on the field. Did, did you grow up as a catcher or did you – were you another position player that became a catcher later? How would that work for you? I, I grew up as a catcher. So since the age of 11, I've basically only been a catcher. And did you – so you, you had the mentality of, look, I'm going to go out there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run this team essentially. Did you feel like you were always kind of the captain on the field? more of a coach uh you were an extension of the coaching staff and you were the only one that could go out there and make adjustments with the pitcher or kind of move an infielder if you need to a little bit based on how you want to pitch guy okay how let's talk about that kind of that the, the catcher pitcher relationship in regards to you know you know you you know the pitcher better than anybody on the field because you you deal with them daily you're catching bullpens. Were there any instances out there that you had to go out and just say, talk to a pitcher? Because you could tell, like, things were kind of falling apart for the guy. Were, were there any cases like that, that that kind of come to mind? Absolutely. Uh, there's a lot of times that you have to go out there, and it's not necessarily to tell them something they don't know. Uh, but they tend to sometimes overthink. So I'd go out there, tell one of my awful jokes, <laughs> Uh, just to get them to think about something other than what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, just to, to slightly change the focus for, you know, 20 seconds. And then after that, tap them on the butt and tell them, all right, let's go and get them. So then they can go ahead and, and refocus. But instead of just keeping everything uh, going poorly for them or that they're struggling with, get them to change what they thought, take a slight break, and then go ahead and refocus. So you, so you could totally sense if a player was, was trying too hard. You could tell sometimes if the pitcher was trying too hard or if they were being too hard upon themselves, uh, you know, trying to be too perfect, um, trying to execute more than they probably should. Um, and that's just from the experience of being with them in the bullpen, in games, and watching them throw multiple times. Gotcha. Was there anybody that really stood out to you in regards to they were just everything kind of just flowed for them? Like someone you caught, they were just 
they seem to always be on point. And so who was that person and how did they, what was different about them, would you say? You know, I would probably say a guy that, that I caught that was a little bit different was Josh Fogg. Um, he was a guy that you knew what he was going to do. You kind of just let him be because he knew when he was off that he just needed to step off, refocus, and then go after it. Uh, he's not one of the guys that you would necessarily need to go out there and talk too much because if he was struggling a little bit, he knew it upon himself to do it. Uh, there's other guys, though, that will tell you. I remember Randy Johnson with the Yankees never wanted to be talked to. Just let him be, let him throw. Um, you put the fingers down, catch the ball, and, and toss it back to him. That's right. Cause was that with the Yankees, the year you spent with the Yankees? Yes. Was there – so you're talking about the Yankees, Pittsburgh to the Yankees. You played in, was it uh, Seattle? Uh, I played in the minor leagues with Seattle um, and then also with the Braves. And the Braves. Now, when you left Pittsburgh, so you still continue to catch with the Braves a little bit and with, with, the, with the Yankees. Was that a – Very little. Kind of like an emergency catcher, like the third right. catcher, right? Because you had that skill. I, I think a lot of people tend to forget that on a major league roster, that there's, there's always that guy that can kind of – it's maybe more of a corner position, right, can play first, can play third, can play the corner outfielders, outfield spots, but that can also catch, you know, but in those emergency situations. And we scout that a little bit, you know, that a, a player actually has that versatility to be able to do that. Yeah, it's, it's a unique skill nowadays, especially when you only have a 25- or 26-man roster. Uh, most teams are only carrying two catchers. Uh, they would rather carry that – extra relief pitcher um, or specialist that can come in and, and get an out or two. So to be able to get back there in an emergency and not, I guess, kill the team is, is always a, a benefit. Right. Let's talk about your, your time in the big leagues. You, were, you had an incredible stretch where I know you're going to probably know this better than I would, but you, had a, you tied or broke – the pinch hit home run record in a single season. You tied it, correct. You, you tied it. What year was that? Let's talk about how you prepared yourself, both physically and mentally, as a player coming off the bench and being ready to hit against, you know, some of these top relievers in the game. Yeah, that was uh, my rookie year in 2001. And what I did to stay ready was – you know, you kind of know when, when you might go up there to hit. Uh, normally it's in a pitcher spot uh, or, you know, if there might be a double switch because you need to get the pitcher's spot to be changed in the order. Um, so what I did was I'd always pay attention to the lineup, but whenever we were in the field, I would go up to the cages, hit off the machine, hit off the tee, and be ready every inning after about the fourth inning. So whenever they would call upon me, I'm good to go. But now you did that every single day? I did that every single game that I wasn't <laughs> playing in. Uh, I spent a lot of time up in the cages by myself, and it, was that, it wasn't too bad. So that, that, that's kind of a whole different animal because you were, you were obviously a, you were a high-round pick. I'm, you played in probably every single game in high school when you were young coming up as a minor leaguer the only days that you didn't play were probably scheduled days off now you get to the big leagues and you're not playing every day how, how did you handle that you know i took it as i just have to be ready every day um whether or not you're in the lineup or not i still had to be ready in the event that they needed me and for the situation i was in i knew it was going to be probably pinch hitting or double switching. So the only thing I could do to stay ready is go up, swing in the cages, make sure I was stretched out, uh, know who was warming up for the other team in the bullpen, know who was pitching, so that when I got my opportunity, I would be ready. So when you were, when you were getting ready and hitting off Iron Mike, was it usually an Iron Mike you were hitting off? Was it? It was an Iron Mike, yes. So you're, were you thinking about – like you were, you are a very simplified, I would say, mechanical, had, had a very simplified mechanical swing. Not a lot of moving parts. 
Um, you, you had a very tall upright position, hands were just kind of right here, and you just you would just step and swing. So walk us through that mentality of, of you as a hitter, and how did you prepare mentally for all that? You know, it's funny because when I went and hit in the cages or went and hit in the game, you completely forget about the mechanics of it. It's something that by then you already should know. Uh, at least for me, if I started thinking about my mechanics, I was done. Um, I had to worry about the pitcher, not worrying about what I did. Walk us but, through that. If you got if you got in a bat, and you started, and you you're in there, like right? you're in the box, and you're you, you, you started thinking about something else rather than hitting the ball. What were some thoughts that maybe came to your mind that got you maybe out of no no thinking? You know, it, it would always be. <laughs> trying to guess what the pitch might be, okay. um, trying to think what the pitcher might try to be doing to me as what I would guess, um, and trying to give them a little too much credit. Uh, my, my high school coach gave me the very basics that when you're hitting. If it's white and moving, hit it. <laughs> uh, try to stop thinking when you're, when you're hitting about everything that you need to do. Uh, that's what practice is for. That's what the cages are for. Uh, that's when working with your coach, that's when you work on the, the mechanics of it. When you get into a game, you hope that those mechanics are, are already solid, and then it's just see the ball, hit the ball. Right. So it, it gets down into really no thoughts, maybe one thought max. Maybe there's a swing cue that you have. Um, everyone has maybe one thought there, but basically – no mind that you want to just be as much, conscious you know, mind. My, my thought was right center okay. um you know try to drive the ball to right center if the pitch was inside that was okay i could go ahead and turn on it but if i tried to pull everything and, and become pull happy then i would just get crushed on the off speed pitches and i'd get crushed on anything that's middle away so i tend to focus on right center and then I would still be able to hit the ball where it was pitched. Did you develop that approach in pro ball, or did you already – were you advanced enough in high school where you started to learn about right center at high school age? I started that in high school. Um, back, you know, in the day when, you know, we were both really young, uh, I would go to the cages with my dad, and he would just feed the machine. And we would alternate it from pitches in, pitches in the middle, pitches away and then depending on where the pitch was we'd go ahead and just work that zone did you hit in your converse you know what back then i didn't wear converse they it was always you know adidas or, or nike or something like that because you know we were more athletic then now it's it's looking good on the beach cruiser and uh yeah. and walking the dog so the converse are a little better look so, so the, the reason I bring that up is Craig, Craig has worn white Converse shoes. It's all you wear, basically, Pretty much. your whole life. And I, I think it's actually amazing. And they, now that they have the, was it Nike or something that bought them out? They got a little more cushion in there. It's more leather, right? You know, I've, I've upgraded <laughs> to, uh, instead of the canvas on the outside of the shoe, it's now the leather. That way I can take my wipes and, and clean them as opposed to trying to toss them into the uh, washing machine. That's right. So, so we're learning new things every day. I mean, we want to bring some pride to this thing, right? So good. So what about you have three kids. I do. Um, your son, Luke, is how old? He is 14. 14, freshman in high school? He's in eighth grade, or he's, he's in the eighth grade now. Uh, he's going to be a freshman next year. Right, so, so he, he's getting into that high school age. Now, let's talk about your relationship with him, former big leaguer. You know, your son's been, been playing pretty much since he was, could, could play. Mm -hmm. How is that relationship with you guys? What have you taught him? Do you, do you coach him? Walk us through that. You know, I coached him from – pretty much the time he started playing until he was about 11. Uh, and the main reason for that is I wanted to make sure that he had the correct fundamentals when he was younger. I know a lot of coaches in, in Little League and Pony uh, are, are dads that have secondary jobs. 
Um, for me, I wanted to make sure that whenever he was on the field, he did something the right way uh, in, in preparing him to play in the future. And at about the age 11, I decided, you know what, it's easier to coach one kid on his own than try to coach 15 of them. So I stepped back. I, I have a – he's on another team where he's – I love the coach. So now I work individually with him one-on-one. -on -one. And honestly, it's been, it's been pretty easy. Uh, the coach to student is a lot easier sometimes than the, the dad to son because he knows that we're talking baseball and that I'm trying to teach him the, the correct things for, for his future. So would you say you, you try to, in a way, separate being dad and coach? Whenever we were on the field, I was never dad. I was always coach. Um, and for him, it was probably a little bit tougher because I have higher expectations for him because I know that what he's been taught, I know what he should know. And when he doesn't do something correctly, because he forgets, that's when he gets a little bit of issues with, with me. Uh, but, you know, in, in the long run, it's worked out really well because it seems like he's been able to take a lot of the stuff that I'm trying to instruct him with and go ahead and apply it on the field. That's awesome. Yeah, it, it's always interesting. You know, I spoke with Jack Wilson the other day, our former teammate, and and he, he's dabbled with coaching and, and still works with this kid a little bit. And it, it's just interesting, the dynamic, how everyone's a little bit different on, I think at some point as dad, we, we want to get out of the way, right? We want right. to teach them what we know, show them and give them enough information. And then hopefully we have good high school coaches, good travel ball coaches, which in our, both of our experiences, we have great coaches around mm -hmm. our boys. So, it's kind of nice to just sit back a little bit. And I, I know when I go watch my kid at high school, it's like, I just want to, we have a hill and I just go sit on the hill and enjoy the game and, and just cheer my kid on really and, and cheer the team on. And that's, that's kind of a fun spot to be in. Correct. I mean, like when, when we went out to Vegas, it was great. I sat back, I watched him play. Uh, I would take some notes and then he would ask me, dad, did you see anything? And if I told him something, then he would go ahead and try to make that adjustment in the future. Is there any type of uh, mindset with your son being a young player? And I, you know, you're you're talking about you were a catcher. You're a big dude. You're what, like almost six three, two thirty plus, like strong, big, big, strong catcher. And Luke is maybe a little bit smaller. He's maybe going to be a late bloomer in that regard. But he's a center fielder. Correct. Uh, he's currently, I think, 5'6", um, which is probably close to the same height that I was when I was his age. Yeah. I mean, uh, who knows how, t how tall he'll be, you know, but he's got a ways to go. Uh, you know, it's, it's funny because we are kind of two different types of, of players. When I was his age, uh, I was more the, the power hitter um, and hit for a high average. I didn't have the speed until I got to my junior, senior year in high school. Then I I grew into the speed. For him, he is fast, uh, and he's more of a line drive ground ball hitter. Because if he hits it in the air, it, it's normally not going to be something that is beneficial for his skill set. Um, he is getting bigger and stronger and, and able to, you know, start to hit the balls to the warning track and stuff like that. But for him, those are considered outs. So we have to get him in a little bit – different mindset than I was. He needs to go up there, try to drive the ball in the gaps. Uh, if he finds a gap and it gets by, it becomes a double or a triple, which for me, it became a single or a double. Um, <laughs> and, you know, for he works the count a lot better uh, because if he draws a walk, then that really turns into a double for him. So the mentality for him is a little bit different uh, depending on situation, outs, runners. Um, you know, I try to get him to be aggressive because he's not always going to be 5'6", and he's not always going to be uh, a guy that necessarily needs to walk to move runners along. I want him to learn to drive the ball at a young age, and then when he gets older, he'll still have that, that skill set and that approach 
at the plate. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I was able to, when you guys came out to Vegas right before our, our COVID-19 shutdown, I was able to watch him play. And I was like, wow, he could, he could run. There's, there's a lot of things to like. And, and I could notice his, there was some patience there, but also an aggressiveness of I'm up there ready to hit every pitch. And if it's a ball, like he kind of had that, my eyes are going to tell me it's a ball, I'm going to stop. Yeah, the, the one thing that, that I've preached to him since he's probably about seven is when he gets up to the plate, the best pitch to hit is that first pitch. Um, whether it be a fastball, a hanging curveball, um, the mentality of it being the best pitch so he is up there ready to hit it. If it's a ball, you go ahead and take it. Then the next best pitch to hit is the second pitch, uh, as opposed to going up there and saying, all right, I'm looking for a fastball inner half. Uh, because if that guy throws one outer half, it doesn't mean you can't swing and hit it still and, and drive the ball. But if you start to try to guess where the pitch is going to be or the location or what pitch it's going to be, you're going to tend to kind of sabotage your at-bat. Um, I don't know about you. For me, I always felt like every at-bat, I'm going to get one pitch to hit. Uh, the pitch is going to make a mistake, whether it be a fastball that he doesn't locate, a curveball that doesn't break as much, a slider that spins. Uh, I'm going to get that one pitch, and if I get that pitch, I'm going to hit it. Mm -hmm. So the mentality was every at-bat, you're going to get one pitch minimum, be ready to hit that pitch. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Something I just thought about, too, um, as we kind of shared our time together in the big leagues, we had some different things. Um, like we talked about earlier, you, you had a pretty simple, easy approach. And we don't need to bring up any names here, but they, there was a, an instance with you that because you're, you had an unorthodox stance, right, in regards mm -hmm. to you were just really tall and upright, not a lot of bend in your knees, that, but that was who you are, who you were. Tell us about, there's kind of a story you have about how there was a potential big change that, that some people didn't like that. Walk, walk us through what that was all about. How that, did it affect you in, in your mindset? You know, my, it was my third year in the big leagues that one of the coaches came up to me and I, I was struggling a little bit. I think I was hitting probably 125. Uh, but at the time, I was the backup catcher. Uh, we didn't really have a third string catcher or anything like that. And, and Jason Kendall was our starting catcher. So, you know, the, third, the, the backup catcher gets zero at bats because if he pinch hits and, and something happens to the catcher, we have no one else to catch. So I was scuffling a little bit. And the coach came up and decided to tell me that I was going to have my batting stance change. Um, from a very simple standing to, I guess you could say a Tony Batista type, where I was completely facing the pitcher with as open as you could get. And I experimented with it a little bit in BP. Didn't really work for me. So then, you know, when we had regular BP, I went to start to hit like I normally do to get prepared for the game. And that coach came up and told me that I have two options. I can either hit how he wants me to hit in the big leagues, or I can go down to AAA and hit like how I want to hit. So I didn't play for the next week. I sat the bench. Uh, I had BP, and I was putting in a, a half effort of, of what he wants because it really wasn't how I hit. It was still uncomfortable. I couldn't see the ball. Uh, it just felt weird, let alone to try to do that against a – a coach that's just throwing strikes against compared to a starting pitcher who's trying to get you out. Uh, so the week later, I go in and he calls me to pinch hit and the bases are loaded. And it's one of those that you, you're going up there and you're thinking, well, what am I going to do? Do I, do I hit like the coach wants me to hit? Or do I hit like I want to hit and, and just say, you know, I'm going to get sent down. And at that at bat, I decided, you know what, I'm going to hit like I hit. Uh, I got to the big leagues hitting this way. It's worked for me my entire life. I'm not going to change it for, for one at bat. Um, you know, I was in a little bit of a funk, and, and that happens. But I still think I could hit it. Mm -hmm. So that at bat, I hit a grand slam. And I came <laughs> back to the dugout, 
and the coach, you know, gave me a high five and never again mentioned anything about my hitting. So, you know, in retrospect, was it something that maybe he was trying to do to get me to stop thinking a certain way? I don't know. Um, but I've learned since then that you always do what is comfortable to you. Uh, if it doesn't work or you're struggling because you can't do it, then you start to tinker. Uh, but always stick with whatever it is that you do and you do well. Yeah, it's interesting because it's it kind of reminds me too of like when when you draft a player, right? You have all these new players coming in and the season starts and then batter gets off to a bad start, right? They're maybe they're 0 for 20, 0 for 25. Things are, you know, and obviously an 0 for 25, that's just an average, but how are you actually getting out? Is it is it, you know, 20 strikeouts and you're not even touching the ball or is it, no, I'm making good contact. I'm having good at bats. Things just aren't falling for me right now. So, but it's interesting how a lot of a lot of teams at the at the professional level they'll have a certain window of like we're not going to touch our hitters for a certain amount of at bats. Maybe that's thirty. Maybe that's forty. I think every organization probably has a different philosophy regarding that. But it's allowing them to say, hey, we drafted you because you do this. You do these these things well. Yeah, there, there might be a small tinker here or there, but we want you to go out and play and be confident. We don't want you thinking about this or that. Um, was there any swing changes for you, even in the minor leagues? Or did you hit the, the way you hit in the big leagues? That was the exact same way you hit in, the, in high school, would you say? For the most part, uh, you know, there, there's always a little bit of tinkering. Uh, you know, sometimes you open your stance up a little bit more. Sometimes you might close it a little bit more. Um, you know, I was always pretty much the same. And for me, the best hitting coaches that I've had are all guys that know that there's not any one particular way to do anything. Um, you know, if you get into a little funk, hey, we might try to tinker here or there in the cage to see if that helps out, if that doesn't. Uh, maybe you're not picking the ball up right. Maybe we'll just, you know, move just a tad. But for the most part, you know, doing what you do and what is, you're comfortable with, as long as, as you can do it and succeed, not changing for anyone. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. So at this point in your life, you're, you're retired. You, you have a beautiful wife. You have three kids. You're kind of just doing your thing, right? Are you, are you, your son's now going into high school. Are you not coaching at all anymore? Are you just completely watching and taking a step back? Where are you at in, in your life now? Right now, I am playing dad off the field. <laughs> uh, on the field, I, I watch him. Um, I work with him on his hitting. We still go up and hit a couple times a week. Um, as for the future, I don't know yet. Um, I could help out at the high school. Um, I could become an assistant coach there. I might just be a, a dad cheering. Uh, a lot of it depends on, on what the high school coach wants and what, what he needs. Uh, but whatever happens, I'm going to be, be the dad sitting back and, and, and helping him out. Sweet, sweet. Now, you went, you went from Pittsburgh, and you played a little bit with the Yankees. What, what was the difference there? And was there, I guess it really in your whole big league career, was there anybody that stood out to you that uh, maybe they took you under your wing, under their wing, and they taught you some things? Uh, I'm talking about more on the mental side of things on, on that really just stood out for you and helped you a lot. You know, when, when I first got to the big leagues, I, I talked a lot with John Vanderwall, uh, Mike Benjamin, uh, Matt Stairs, guys that, you know, they weren't necessarily playing every day, but I kind of picked their brains to see how they stayed ready mm -hmm. uh, between cages, fielding, throwing into a net, um, you know, just, trying to make the transition from playing every day, which you know what you're going to do when you're batting, uh, how to get ready to not playing every day and how to actually be ready for that situation. And, and those guys helped me a lot in, in, in being ready when you weren't necessarily playing. Yes, okay. What about, um, you know, as far as just confidence and – you know, we, I think we all, in a way, in some aspects of our life, we have some self-doubt, 
right? There, there's some things we don't believe within ourselves. Did you ever have any of that? Do you still have any of that? And if so, like, how do you work that out? You know what? I never had that. Um, I, I didn't care who was pitching. I always felt like I was going to hit it. Um, you know, I, I still think right now I could probably get up there and as long as I knew the fastball was coming, I'd be able to hit that pretty good. Uh, I always thought that I could do it. Uh, sometimes I'd get into a little bit of a funk, and then it was just taking a step back, refocusing on that, and then going back up there. So even as a kid, like, talking literally up through high school, was it, did you feel like, at any point like I, I'm way too confident to where I'm cocky or was it just always this internal like I'm pretty good like I, I can do this it, it was always an internal thing um, I always wanted to be the best player on the field and that was my goal whether it be uh, a game in Little League in Pony high school practice high school game uh, that was my mentality uh, I was going to outwork everyone, I was going to outplay everyone, and I was going to be the best guy there. And that has something that, that for me, I've always uh, driven to do. Do you ever see kids get caught up in, like, comparing themselves to, to other players? I have. Uh, and what I try to tell them is just be yourself. Um, you know, a, a baseball team that is, is put together isn't put together with nine guys that hit home runs. Uh, you're still going to need that guy that gets on base, the guy that plays defense, the guy that can steal bases. Uh, it's not an all-star team that goes out and wins. It's the best team. So whatever it is that you do well, continue to do that well. Focus on that. Work on the other things to improve those. But just remember that you don't need to be like someone else to get better. Be yourself, and that's what will help the team the most. No doubt. I, I think that's too, when you see really successful teams, you can really kind of see the different personalities that, that exude on a team. You got you know, that high-energy guy. He's kind of bouncing all over, over the place, high-fiving everybody. Um, you know, I think you and I were, were kind of more similar, more even keel. Um, not loud, just we just we're just kind of there doing our job, enjoying it. Right. Um, and then it's interesting. So I think that those are important points of of how teams work and teamwork of having those loud, boisterous guys, the more mellow, um, just kind of even kill guys. So it kind of makes it gel together, I think. Correct. Good. Was there anything else, Craig, that you want to mention and, and maybe just talk anything more about the mental game, anything that you think can really help prepare these young kids and help them out? You know, the, the one thing that I've always preached uh, to my son, to the kids when I coach them, is that whenever they're doing drills, whether it be in the batting cage, whether it's taking ground balls, taking fly balls, uh, do it as if you would in a game. Take your same approach that you take in a game at the plate into the cages. Because that way, when you get into a game, it'll just flow from one part to the other. You don't have to sit there and start thinking, well, how did I do it in the cages? Uh, how am I going to do it now? How did I back up a ground ball in the game? If you do everything uh, correctly the first time, uh, if you always try to do it right and have the right approach, then when the game comes, it's just a reaction as opposed to trying to think and, and figure out what you're going to be doing. No doubt. And that's, that's the whole, you, you, in practice, you're consciously working on things. You're, you're trying to get better. You're trying to do these things. And then once you get to the game, this, we, won't, we want to play in the subconscious mind, right? We want to play where it's, we're just not thinking. It just happens. And we don't try hard. We just do it. Correct. I mean, it, in practice, it may not be the, the most enjoyable thing as a center fielder to run and back up a ball that you know that the left fielder is going to field. But that one time that you don't do it in a game and it gets by him because you figure he's going to do it, you look bad. Mm -hmm. So you always want to make sure that you're in that right spot, that you have the right approach, that you know where the ball is going to go, uh, that all the things that you prep in practice, you just roll over into a game and just do. Yeah, no doubt, man. Well, th this has been awesome. 
Um, I, I appreciate you coming on board with me here and, and kind of chatting it out. We, we certainly have all the time in the world. That's true. <laughs> right now to do that. And, and I was just thinking, seeing you here, I think this is the shortest I've ever seen your hair. Uh, yeah, I got it cut like <laughs> know, three months ago, probably. Um, and now it's, you know, growing out. I'm not going to cut it myself. Um, and I definitely would not trust my wife to cut it. So we're just going to let it grow for a little while. There you go. Well, usually you got, you got some flow in the back, you know, and when, when people would describe like, hey, who, who do you keep in contact with after your playing career? I was like, well, Craig Wilson probably by far the most. And I would, ha I would describe him like Craig Wilson, like, yeah, he was a big, strong dude, could hit a ball a mile. He kind of had long blonde hair, cis sandy blonde. And because uh, usually he was down here. And, and that's, right. usually, that's usually what, oh, yeah, I remember that guy. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a lot of fun. But when the summer comes, it tends to get a little bit hot. And, and now that I'm just sitting around doing nothing, you know, I'm trying to keep as cool as I can. Awesome. Good. Well, I'm excited. Hopefully this doesn't ruin every year you come out to Vegas and we hang out and uh, you stay at the Tahiti Village in, in Vegas. And we uh, hang out at the pool and you go to some shows and stuff. So hopefully that doesn't ruin our summer, you know, this year. Oh, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully this gets taken care of here, here pretty soon. But again, dude, I appreciate you coming on board. It probably won't be the last time. We'll, we'll keep asking you for your thoughts and opinions. And thanks, dude. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right. Hey, what's up, guys? Hopefully you enjoyed this conversation with Craig Wilson. He's one of my best buddies, just a great dude. If you are looking for yourself or your student athlete and wants more information in regards to just working on their mental game, head over to mentaledge.training. Over at that website, I have a course that's uh, 52 weeks. It's a video per week. Um, I share video. I have uh, workbooks for, for these players and kids to work on. And then I actually answer uh, questions that they have as they work throughout this whole course. So if you're interested in that, go take a peek. Again, that's at mentaledge.training. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you.